हेलो एवरीवन गुड मॉर्निंग टुडे इज ट्वेंटी ऑफ सितंबर एंड वेलकम टू द हिंदू न्यूज़पेपर एनालिसिस डिस्कशन सो गाइस इन द टुडेज वीडियो विल बी डिस्कसिंग द एंटायर हिंदू न्यूज़पेपर अलोंग विद द आर्टिकल्स देयर बैकग्राउंड एज वेल एज द डिटेल्ड वे फॉरवर्ड एंड मीन आई वुड लाइक टू टेल यू दैट यू कैन डाउनलोड द एक्सप्लेनर पी फ्रॉम द टेलीग्राम चैनल एंड इन दिस एक्सप्लेनर पी यू कैन एक्सेस ऑल द नोट्स ऑफ द आर्टिकल्स दैट वी हैव डिस्कसड टूडे लिंक फॉर द टेलीग्राम चैनल हैज बिन गिवन इन द डिस्क्रिप्शन बॉक्स इन द यूट्यूब फाइन नाउ लेट्स स्टार्ट विद द टूडेज न्यूज पेपर बट बिफोर दैट लेट सी द ओवर व्यू ऑफ द एंटायर न्यूज पेपर फर्स्ट मोर ओवर गाइज आई वुड लाइक टू टेल यू वन न्यूज दैट फ्रॉम टूमोरो ऑनवर्ड्स आई विल ऑल्सो बी गिविंग यू कपल ऑफ मेन्स क्वेश्चन ऑन टू द आर्टिकल्स दैट हैव कम सो दैट यू कैन प्रैक्टिस ऑन दैट सो फ्रॉम टूमोरो ऑनवर्ड्स विल बी स्टार्टिंग द मेन्स क्वेश्चन ऑल्सो एज यू हैव रिक्वेस्टेड नाउ लेट स्टार्ट so we have here the page number 1 of the hindu the first article center bans pfi 8 front bodies okay so guys in the past we have seen that the raids were made on to the pfi into the past and now the ban has been made then guys <coughs> moving on in this particular direction center extends the free ration scheme for 3 months so we'll see the pradhan pradhan mantri garib kalyan an yojana what this entire scheme is all about and all that thing then the political articles not important in this particular direction after that guys here we can see that archaeological survey of india has found the buddhist caves temples into the bandavgarh tiger reserve so guys uh, basically when we talk about this particular article fine <coughs> the buddhist caves stoops fine have been discovered okay now th this particular these particular caves they are dating back to around second century okay and uh, along along with that the hindu temples from 9th to 11th century have also been found now guys uh, basically when we talk about this particular uh, this particular architecture this architecture has been found into the bandavgarh tiger reserve is it clear moving on after that <coughs> in the city section uh, 862 dengue cases and all these things are not important with respect to the examination fine then guys the regional issues political news etc has been given no need to go here okay these tenders etc has been given no need to go too much into the detail now moving on after that uh, we'll be reaching directly to the editorial section and in the editorial section the first article talks about the globe changing reverberation of the ukraine war now see this thing that the russia ukraine war is going on and in this russia ukraine war we have seen that into the past ukraine recaptured many of the territories that were taken back by the russia now this particular article is giving the many minor details of the russia ukraine war that how many passports got issued how many how much territory got acquired and all those kind of a things now for the upsc the article is not containing much of a substance because of guys number 1 this russia ukraine war is uh, is is a kind of a ongoing war and the situations are changing day by day so no need to go into that particular thing all these things will change secondly guys much of the microscopic details okay issues have been given which are not relevant in the examinations okay so uh, i have told you many number of times guys that the day to day development in russia ukraine war that okay today that happened tomorrow that happened will not mean anything by the time you will be writing your exam then in nature's warning a nudge to riparian states now this is a very very good article and this article is talking about the concerns of the riparian state okay trans boundary rivers and all those kind trans boundary rivers all these things have been discussed very good article will discuss this entire article then the separately together so guys this article is talking about that the opposition is divided as how to tackle the bjp okay so the different different political leaders okay they have different different kind of narratives okay then moving on <coughs> talent recognition now this article is talking about the reform into the science awards that is being made we'll see this particular article also then rediscovering the bay of bengal so we'll see that how in the bimstech how basically how the bimstech can be a very important in uh, initiative in this particular direction we'll see this entire issue kerala the ever elusive state of the bjp now political article not important for exam automation has impacted the lower level jobs in the banks now we'll see this entire article okay and we'll see one dimension that how the automation is leading to the job losses then moving on the text and the context section limited de democracy unlimited theocracy so now the iran protests are going on and in this particular direction basically the limited democracy into the iran has been discussed so briefly we'll see this article then moving on after that the indian national congress a grand old party with a demanding path of its revival now guys this is uh, an archives article which talks about that how the uh, indian national congress needs the kind of an urgent reforms but again the article is political article fine 
fine and such kind of things are not important for our examination okay so no need to go in this particular detail then after that eastern commands ex chief anil chohan is chief of defense staff so the institution uh, basically the post of the chief of defense staff cds on the, the military reforms on this particular line will see in this particular article then after that moving on <coughs> Uh, UP issues a timetable for madrasas. Okay, now not important article for the examination. Then uh, moving on in this particular direction, bench to check if greater curbs can be imposed on ministers' speeches. So in the past we have seen this particular thing that many a times ministers and uh, the leaders they have met, they have made speeches which have which had the potential to incite some communal tensions okay now we need to understand this particular we need to understand this particular thing that can we control the hate speeches by such kind of a ministers because this is always a kind of a complicated issue because guys already we know that under the article number 19 right to speech and expression has been given right to speech and expression has been given and in that particular direction in that particular direction the ministers also invoke the right of free speech and expression even while giving the speeches but at the same time there is also the reasonable restriction so how we can impose such kind of restriction that will be checked by the judiciary that will be checked by the judiciary the supreme court okay so as if final thing will be finalized in this particular direction we need to see that particular thing but right now the supreme court had said that will go in that matter okay then moving on uh, here the political articles etc have been given okay uh, no, no need to go too much into the detail then moving on growers sees red as 5000 apple trucks got struck into the jam Okay, uh, then moving on after that thing, the Jay Shankar US NSA discussed strategic ties and the Ukraine war. Okay, so basically we have seen this thing that the Minister of External Affairs, okay, recently visited the uh, recently visited the US also for the UNGA session. So many such kind of things have been discussed. Okay, so strategic issues, Ukraine war, and all those things have been there. Then moving on on the world page. Okay, then guys. Uh, Ukraine referendum results point in Russia's annexation. So again, I told you this thing that this Russia-Ukraine war day-to-day -day developments are not that much very important. We could not agree more uh, uh, Blinken on PM Modi's message to Putin. So we have seen this particular thing that the Prime Minister has asked the, uh, the Putin that this war should now come to an end. So the USA is supporting that particular thing. Okay, then moving on after that, uh, the business page, budget to reset tax laws to decriminalize sections in IT GST. Now we'll see this particular thing that what proposals have been made. Fine, stocks extend slide, rupee hits a new low. So every day, the levels at which the rupee is, at, uh, rupee is standing, all these things have been discussed. Okay, then uh, the forex reserves to dip by $23 billion by the December. So we see that throughout this 2022, throughout this particular 2022, the forex reserves have been declined. Why? Because our imports have become more costly particularly when we talk about the energy imports that india is making 82 percent of india's energy requirements are met by the imports and as global crude oil prices have increased so high okay so we are imports have become expensive so therefore our forex reserves are declining moreover moreover we also find this particular thing that the fpis foreign portfolio investment that came in india since 2020 now they are going back so by that also the forex reserves are going down and it will decline by 23 billion dollar by 20 uh, by, by december so these are the estimates these are the estimates obviously the final number will get by the end of year only okay so that is all guys about that after that now we have the sports page okay uh, the new uh, tata ev has been launched not important article okay then uh, uh, the sports page is there okay uh, the and the news related to the india south africa match has been discussed and all those things are there now let's discuss all these relevant articles one by one in the detail okay let's discuss all these relevant articles now starting up okay uh, before that uh, let me see there is a question uh, please tell me how much percent current affairs will be asked in the mains examination. See, dear, there is no guideline by the UPSC that, okay, this much current affairs will be asked. But understand this particular thing, that the mains questions that are being asked, they need, their base will be prepared by the static, but then they have to be complemented with the current affairs. Moreover, there are many questions which are outrightly also being asked from the, uh, which are also outrightly being asked from the contemporary development. So, contemporary developments play a 
क्वाइट वेरी बिग इंपॉर्टेंट रोल बिकॉज नो क्वेश्चन विल कंप्लीटली बी स्टेटिक इट हैज टू बी कॉम्प्लीमेंटेड विद कंटेम्प्ररी थीम्स कंटेम्प्ररी एग्जाम्पल्स कंटेम्प्ररी केस स्टडीज द इशूज लॉज जजमेंट्स दैट हैड कम सो फॉर दैट पर्टिकुलर थिंग यू नीड टू सी यू नीड टू सी द करंट अफेयर्स वेरी वेरी इफेक्टिवली नाउ मूविंग ऑन Let's take the first. Uh, uh, let's take the GS quotation for the today. So today we'll take the GS quotation from the Gay Lord Nelson. Now, Gay Lord Nelson says uh, that the ultimate test of man's conscience may be his willingness to sacrifice something today for future generations whose words of thanks will not be heard. Okay. Now understand this particular thing. First of all, what do we mean by conscience? okay so conscience means okay man's conscience conscience means a subtle voice which tells you what's correct what's not correct okay subtle voice internal voice that's the conscience now our conscience many are uh, it talks about that ultimate test of men's conscience that whether it's an ethical conscience or not it is determined that whether a person is ready to sacrifice something today okay even when he'll not receive any applause even when nobody is going to say thanks to him you can take the example of the freedom fighters who fought for the indian independence they sacrificed their lives even they sacrificed their comfort they sacrificed their lives they sacrificed their family even okay how for what for indian independence and many of them for example the great bhagat singh okay he was who he was not living to see the independence he was not there to receive the thanks but still he sacrificed so that was the, the ultimate test of the conscience okay so ultimate test of the men's conscience is that whether a man is willing to sacrifice something today for the future generations is it clear or not now guys when we talk about this ultimate test of a conscience we need to be considerate on many of the factors for example today we need to conserve the environment today we need to conserve the environment so that the future generations can also enjoy that obviously those future generations we will not be there to receive that particular thanks but still we need to do that thing as a part of our ethical responsibility and as a part of our moral responsibility is it clear or not moreover i want to just give you one more idea even the swami vivekananda said that ethics is not about self but ethics is non self so you need to look beyond your selfish interest for the future generations so very very good idea this particular idea can be implemented uh, can be used in the gs paper number 4 ethics gs paper number 4 ethics integrity and aptitude okay now move uh, let's take the first article okay so the first article center extends free ration scheme for 3 months center extends free ration scheme for the 3 months okay now guys uh, we'll see this particular article with respect to the gs paper number 2 issues of social justice gs paper number 2 issues of social justice okay now actually what has happened i will tell you first of all the back, uh, i will tell you first of all the background and then we'll go in this particular article okay so uh, basically we have find this thing uh, we we have already seen this particular thing that due to the coming of the covid 19 pandemic due to the coming of the covid 19 pandemic first of all a health health crisis started first of all a health crisis started covid 19 was an health emergency then what happened the lockdown was imposed and as the lockdown was imposed it turned into the economic emergency or it became a kind of an economic catastrophe it became an economic emergency in that particular thing many of the people lose their livelihood many of the people lost their livelihood they came on to the brink of poverty and at that point of a time to support these poor people in order to make sure that their food food security is not threatened government came out with the garib kalyan package government come out with the garib kalyan package now guys uh, you might be knowing this thing that actually in 2020 government gave a 20 lakh crore rupees of fiscal stimulus and under that 20 lakh crore rupees of fiscal stimulus actually the atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan was started okay now within the atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan which was a 20 lakh crore rupees fiscal package the uh, the garib kalyan package was given and under this garib kalyan package there was the pradhan mantri garib kalyan an yojana that was started pradhan mantri garib kalyan an yojana now this garib kalyan an yojana was a kind of a it was a, it was a kind of a step to make sure that the hunger doesn't increases so that the people have the basic entitlement such as food now what was the provision of this pradhan mantri garib kalyan an yojana so basically under this under this 80 crore 
अंडर दिस एटी करोड़ पीपल और एटी करोड़ राशन कार्ड होल्डर्स दे विल प्रोवाइडेड एडिशनल फूड ग्रेन दैट इज द फाइव के जी ऑफ एडिशनल फूड ग्रेन वर प्रोवाइडेड टू दैम ना अंडरस्टैंड दिस पर्टिकुलर थिंग अंडरस्टैंड दिस पर्टिकुलर थिंग दैट ऑलरेडी वी आर रनिंग द नेशनल फूड सिक्योरिटी एक्ट नेशनल फूड सिक्योरिटी एक्ट टू थाउजेंड एंड थर्टीन अंडर द नेशनल फूड सिक्योरिटी एक्ट बेसिकली अंडर द नेशनल फूड सिक्योरिटी एक्ट सेवेंटी फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द रूरल पॉपुलेशन फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ द अर्बन पॉपुलेशन एंड इन टोटल सिक्सटी सिक्स परसेंट पॉपुलेशन ऑफ द इंडिया सिक्सटी सिक्स परसेंट पॉपुलेशन ऑफ इंडिया ऑन टू द बेसिस ऑफ टू थाउजेंड इलेवन सेंसस सिक्सटी सिक्स परसेंट पॉपुलेशन ऑफ इंडिया ऑन टू द बेसिस ऑफ टू थाउजेंड इलेवन सेंसस वर प्रोमिस्ड दैट दे विल बी गिवन द सब्सिडाइज फूड ग्रेन सब्सिडाइज फूड ग्रेन वर गिवन ओके सो अंडर द नेशनल फूड सिक्योरिटी एक्ट देर आर द प्रायरिटी हाउस होल्ड्स हु आर गिवन फाइव के जी फूड ग्रेन फाइव के जी फूड ग्रेन पर मेंबर 5 kg food grains per member at very subsidized prices what are the subsidized prices 3 rupees kg rice 2 rupees kg wheat and 1 rupees kg coarse grains 1 rupees kg coarse grains millets etc are given to them okay now under the national food security act priority households get 5 kg food grains per member now guys understand this particular thing there are one more type of households that is the antyodaya अन योजना अंत्योदय अन योजना हाउस होल्ड्स नाउ दिज अंत्योदय अन योजना हाउस होल्ड्स आर द पुअरेस्ट ऑफ द पुअर दे आर दे आर द पुअरेस्ट ऑफ द पुअर सो एक्चुअली रादर देन गिविंग दैम फाइव के जी पर मेंबर दे आर गिवन अ यूनिफॉर्म एलोकेशन ऑफ थर्टी फाइव के जी पर फैमिली थर्टी फाइव के जी फूड ग्रेन आर गिवन टू दैम इवन देर आर द टू मेंबर्स थ्री मेंबर्स दे विल बी गिवन द थर्टी फाइव के जी फूड ग्रेन ओके सो दिस इज अ नेशनल फूड सिक्योरिटी एक्ट दैट इज ऑलरेडी गोइंग ऑन एंड अंडर दिस इफ वी टॉक अबाउट द मेजोरिटी ऑफ द हाउस होल्ड दे आर बिंग गिवन द फाइव के जी फूड ग्रेन पर मेंबर नाउ ड्यूरिंग द टाइम ऑफ द कोविड नाइनटीन पेंडेमिक अपार्ट फ्रॉम दिस अपार्ट फ्रॉम वट एवर इज बींग गिवन एडिशनल फाइव के जी एडिशनल फाइव के जी वॉज प्रोमिस्ड अंडर द अंडर द प्रधानमंत्री गरीब कल्याण अन योजना एडिशनल फाइव के जी वॉज प्रोमिस्ड इज इट क्लियर और नॉट नाउ दिस पर्टिकुलर दिस पर्टिकुलर फूड ग्रेन विल बी गिवन आइदर इन टू द फॉर्म ऑफ राइस और इट विल बी गिवन इन टू द फॉर्म ऑफ द वीट सो वट विल हैपन इन टू द फॉर्म ऑफ द राइस or into the form of the wheat the free 5 kg food grains will be provided by through the public distribution system now originally this particular scheme was started in 2020 for 3 month period for 3 month period that is the period of april to june 2020 but since then this particular scheme has been extended repeatedly and now what has happened from the october 1 this particular scheme has been extended to another 3 months so from 2020 this scheme is repeatedly being extended and now again it has been extended okay so this is something that has happened fine now understand uh, one more thing i want to tell you that when it was started way back in 2020 apart from these 5 kg food grains 1 kg of pulses was also given in order to ensure the protein security but now the pulses have been discontinued and only the 5 kg rice and or 5 kg wheat 5 kg rice or wheat is being given now what are the challenges that will come what are the challenges that will come right now in the implementation of this particular particular scheme so basically it has been said that uh, see right now the government has provided uh, that that rice uh, just a minute the government has provided that rice will be given instead of wheat as the stocks of the wheat are now very much down okay but one more thing if you remember if you remember just two yeah two or three days back i have explained you one article on the indian monsoons performance this year where we have seen that indian monsoons performance was it was a 7% surplus but there was high inequity in the northwest of india in the east of india the rainfalls were not proper they were erratic so what has happened it has impacted it has impacted the uh, rice uh, rice production in india so you understand this particular thing that now th this extension that has been given okay we have said that this time will not provide wheat will only provide the rice but the procurement of rice will be turned to the target or not because we know this thing that the production of the rice is declined is less by the 7 million tons due to the rainfalls and at the same time wheat are also not into the stock now if i give you some of the data then the stocks of rice and wheat are at the lowest level since 2017 so in the past 5 years they are at the lowest levels so whether will be able to deliver onto this particular scheme or not that's something that's to be seen okay so that's all guys about this particular entire 
आर्टिकल फाइन आई होप दैट द बैकग्राउंड इन्फॉर्मेशन फॉर एग्जाम्पल द आत्मनिर्भर भारत अभियान अंडर द आत्मनिर्भर भारत अभियान गरीब कल्याण पैकेज एंड अंडर द गरीब कल्याण कल्याण पैकेज द प्रधानमंत्री गरीब कल्याण अन योजना इज देयर वेयर एडिशनल फूड ग्रेन अपार्ट फ्रॉम एन एफ एस ए एडिशनल फूड ग्रेन अपार्ट फ्रॉम एन एफ एस ए आर बींग गिवन ओके सो दैट्स ऑल गाइज अबाउट दिस पर्टिकुलर आर्टिकल एंड नाउ विल मूव टू द नेक्स्ट आर्टिकल नाउ द the next article that we'll take first of all let's read the heading eastern commands ex chief anil chohan is chief of defense staff okay so guys this particular article this particular article we'll see with respect to the gs paper number 3 gs paper number 3 okay gs paper number 3 security related issues security related issues सिक्योरिटी रिलेटेड इशूज जी एस पेपर नंबर थ्री नाउ बिफोर गोइंग इन दिस पर्टिकुलर आर्टिकल लेट्स टॉक सम ऑफ द बैकग्राउंड इन्फॉर्मेशन ओके एंड दैट बैकग्राउंड इन्फॉर्मेशन आई हैड प्रोवाइडेड यू हेयर इन द नोट्स ऑल्सो ओके नाउ सी दिस पर्टिकुलर थिंग दैट एक्चुअली वी हैव सीन दैट फ्यू मंथ्स बैक फ्यू मंथ्स बैक द फॉर्मर एंड द फर्स्ट चीफ डिफेंस ऑफ स्टाफ जनरल बिपिन रावत पास्ड अवे इन अ फेटल एयर क्रैश दैट हैपेंड ओके and after that now the now we have got the new chief of defense staff is it clear or not now so in this particular article i will not be telling you that who has assumed the charge of the chief of defense staff okay that's not only the important thing because for our examination we need to see this entire concept of the chief of defense staff what are the functions of the cds how the cds will be imp- will be important to bring some of organizational reforms into the defense forces all that dimensions we need to see so we'll be starting from the very scratch now understand that first of all when we talk about the position of the chief of defense staff okay it has been formed just in 2019 and actually the idea is pretty old okay so the first time the idea of a creation of the position of chief of defense staff was recommended in 2001 so guys you might be knowing that before that in 1999 there was the kargil war that happened now basically to review the kargil war and the lessons that have been learned by the kargil war government constituted the kargil uh, government constituted the kargil review committee kargil review committee and this kargil review committee submitted its report on to the kargil war and india's performance now after this particular kargil review committee was created and it submitted its report to study this particular report a group of ministers was formed a group of ministers was formed and this group of ministers in 2001 suggested that in order to make sure that india's defense preparedness is even more effective we need to have we need to have the chief of defense staff we need to have the chief of defense staff so this was suggested then what happened in 2016 in 2016 the db uh, db shekatkar committee so db shekatkar lieutenant general db shekatkar committee again suggested that we need to have the post of cds that is the chief of defense staff okay so in 2001 as well as 2016 that was recommended and post 2019 this idea got implemented in I- india now what is the position of cds what will be the role of the cds how effective the cds will be all these things we'll see here now first of all when we talk about the cds that is the chief of defense staff chief of defense star is the four star general it's a four star general or four star officer in the defense forces and what's the most important and principal role of the cds is that he acts as a principal military advisor to the defense minister on all the tri services matters so basically you understand this thing that guys today we are find we are facing the possibility of two front war now if you if you see india is actually sandwiched between two of the hostile neighbor on one hand we have pakistan on other hand we have china now as there are the two hostile neighbor there can be the possibility of the two front war there can be the possibility of the two front war now here we need to make sure that our defense forces are prepared and at the same time we need to make sure that our defense forces have synergy they have a cooperation between them and in order to 
bring synergy in order to bring the cooperation fine the position of the cds has been created it will bring the jointness it will bring the synergy it will bring the cooperation and all the matters operational matters procurement related matters will be conveyed to the defense ministry now understand this particular thing that actually the defense ministry the defense ministry raksha mantralya and after that the defense forces after that the defense forces are there in between so the cds the cds cds will act as a bridge between these two cds will act as a bridge between these two now basically what has happened guys recently recently the department of military affairs has been created newly this department of military affairs will be giving the entire first hand information with respect to the matters of the defense forces to the defense minister and the cds is actually the chief of the dma that is the department of Mil Milit uh, military affairs so the cds cds is the chief of the department of military affairs that has been recently created now understand one more thing i want to tell you it was not the case that before cds there was no mechanism for bringing the synergy between the three forces there were certain mechanisms and i will tell you a little bit about that so basically earlier there was the chief of staff committees there was the chief of staff committee now chief of staff committee before the cds was given the responsibility to bring synergy into the tri services matter but actually what happened the chief of staff committees was not able to was was not able to perform that role very much effectively because number one when we talk about the actual chairmanship of the chief of staff committees it was held on to the rotation by three of the chiefs of the three wings okay so we have indian air force we have navy we have army so their chiefs were holding this particular position on to the rotational basis okay so therefore what happened one aligned ideology was not coming in this particular thing one issue second thing is that the chairman of the cosc obviously he will be coming from one particular kind of a wing so the inclination towards that particular wing was more inclination towards for example if right now the chief is coming from the air force then the inclination of towards the air force will be more if this it's coming from army the inclination towards the army will be more so that is the issue so therefore it was provided that this uh, arrangement is to be replaced with some kind of a permanent uh, arrangement and therefore the cds was brought and the chief of defense staff became the permanent chairman of the cosc permanent chairman of the chief of staff committee is it clear or not so that is something that has happened after that after that the cds is also given the authority to provide a directive to all the three chiefs all the three chiefs in the case of a war in the case of a war suppose that's the case then all the three chiefs will be given the directives that how the cooperation can be brought moreover the cds the cds as the chief of the department of military affairs will also uh, will also ensure the operationalization of theaterization of command okay joint theaters of joint theaters or joint command theaters will be formed now what is this idea of the joint theaters of command okay now guys when we talk about the theater command theater command is a structure which is designed to control all the military assets in a theater of war okay in a theater of war for example for example in the north for example in the north let's suppose india is fighting the war with china <laughs> india is fighting the war with china so this is the nadan theater okay this is a nadan theater nadan theater it is a region where the war is going on so this is a theater of war now in this theater of war suppose we are fighting the war with the china we need to use the air power we need to use the air power okay we need to use the army we need to use the army also at this particular juncture so basically when what what's the idea of theaterization idea of theaterization means that for a particular theater there needs to be a kind of a dedicated structure it has been provided that under the one commander under the one commander all the resources of all the forces will be placed okay so one commander will be given the responsibility that he can direct the air forces he can direct the army or if needed he can also direct the navy he can also direct the navy for a particular theater is it clear or not so what is a theaterization theaterization means that for a particular region all the three forces needs to be aligned together so that they can operate as one unified 
एजेंसी इज इट क्लियर सो वी वॉन्ट टू ब्रिंग वी वॉन्ट टू बिल्ड द थिएटर कमांड्स नाउ वेन वी टॉक अबाउट एट प्रेजेंट वी हैव अ ज्वाइंट कमांड फॉर द अंडमान एंड निकोबार आईलैंड बट वी नीड टू डेवलप दीज ज्वाइंट कमांड्स टूवर्ड्स द ईस्ट टूवर्ड्स द नॉर्थ टूवर्ड्स द वेस्ट फाइन एंड दिस पर्टिकुलर वर्क विल बी डन बाय सी डी एस सो द ज्वाइंट कमांड्स ओके और द थिएटराइजेशन विल बी डन बाय द सी डी एस देन द सी डी एस विल ऑल्सो बी फंक्शनिंग एज विल बी परफॉर्मिंग एन एडवाइजरी रोल इन टू द न्यूक्लियर कमांड अथॉरिटी न्यूक्लियर कमांड अथॉरिटी नाउ यू सी दिस थिंग यू नो दैट वी हैव द न्यूक्लियर वेपन एंड एट द सेम टाइम इंडिया इज ऑल्सो रनिंग द नो फर्स्ट यूज पॉलिसी अंडर द नो फर्स्ट यूज पॉलिसी वी आर वेरी क्लियर दैट विल नॉट यूज द न्यूक्लियर वेपन फर्स्ट okay will only be using the nuclear weapon if there is an attack from some an adversary and then in a retaliatory manner only the india will be using the nuclear weapon and then the attack can be disproportionate as well okay now in case of any nuclear attack has to be made so who will be taking the decision so there is the, the nuclear command authority and in this nuclear command authority the advisory role will be played by the cds moreover as he is an advisor into the nuclear command authority he will also be given the task to review the india's nuclear doctrine now i told you already that we are right now running the nfu no first use policy no first use policy now many times the suggestions has been made that this no first use policy is needed to be changed why because we are now wedged between the pakistan and china both are hostile both are having the nuclear weapons are you getting it or not and it has been said that if one country attacks us first will we be having the capability to, now see nuclear weapons have become very sophisticated they can they can bring so much of catastrophe so once an attack has been made will the country be able to reciprocate later words that is a very big question so rather than the no first use we should change it okay that if there is any threat then india can use it so for that thing the cds will play a very important role and then cds will play the role in the defense budget optimization defense budget optimization now you see that we find this thing for example particularly when we talk about the indian air force the fleets of the aircraft they are getting really old and they are needed to be replaced for that particular thing we are procuring the rafale jets also then the hindustan aeronautical limited also is working on that particular dimension okay so you see this thing that the aircraft fleets are aging then guys there are many of the capital assets okay weaponry that is to be procured by all the three wings of our defense forces so for that particular thing a defense budget fine needs to be more optimized every rupee of a defense budget needs to spend in such a way that it further increases the preparedness of india now how to use that defense budget judiciously how to use that defense budget more properly so that defense budget optimization will also be done by the cds so prioritization will be done for the capital acquisitions more weaponry more machineries okay they should be procured so for that the cds will play a very important role so these are guys is all the functions of the responsibilities of the cds okay and we find this particular thing that eastern commands ex chief uh, fine anil chohan okay has now assumed okay so lieutenant general lieutenant general here uh, just a minute lieutenant general so lieutenant general anil chohan has assumed the role of the cds now okay and he has succeeded the first cds who was the first cds general bipin rawat and as i had told you that general bipin rawat unfortunately passed away in a helicopter crash in the 2021 okay so that is something that has happened okay so this is guys all about this particular article okay so this is the academically relevant substance which you need to see for here that's all about it and now we'll move to the next article limited democracy unlimited theocracy limited democracy unlimited theocracy now what this particular article is talking about okay guys uh, uh, we have seen if you remember just a couple of days back that the protests in the iran are going on the protests in the iran are going on now this particular article is analyzing it is it is analyzing the iran's political setup and why there are the issues that are coming into the case of iran so that's will be seeing here in this particular article now first of all you need to understand this particular thing that when the 
पॉलिटिकल क्राइसिस विद इन अ स्टेट आर गोइंग ऑन ओके और विद इन एनी कंट्री आर गोइंग ऑन यू आर नॉट नीडेड टू गो टू मच इन टू द डिटेल दैट ओके विच पॉलिटिकल पार्टी डिड विच टाइप ऑफ रोल हाउ मेनी पीपल गॉट किल्ड इन विच सिटी द टैक्स वर कैरीड ओके ऑल दोज थिंग्स आर नॉट वेरी मच इंपॉर्टेंट बट एट द सेम टाइम जस्ट द ब्रॉडर थीम्स आर नीडेड टू बी अंडरस्टूड द ब्रॉडर थीम्स आर नीडेड टू बी अंडरस्टूड मोर ओवर वेन वी टॉक अबाउट द इरान ओके दिस द इरान हैपन्स टू बी considerably more important this particular year why because multiple developments that had happened number one guys recently when the sco recently when the indian prime minister participated in the sco that is the shanghai cooperation organization sco meet okay the iran's iran was also present there and with the iran the bilateral talks have been held by the prime minister with the iran the bilateral talks have been held moreover recently we have seen this particular thing that the chabahar port okay we have seen that india has uh, considerably invested onto the chabahar port and chabahar port has almost got completed okay now the chabahar port which india has developed in iran chabahar port which india has developed in iran chabahar port will give the connectivity to afghanistan it will it, it will give connectivity to the afghanistan so india will get connectivity to afghanistan by the chabahar port you know direct you know this particular thing that we don't have right now the viable land connectivity with afghanistan we requested the pakistan that you please give us connectivity to afghanistan but pakistan refused so from iran will be reaching to afghanistan and for that the chabahar port is important moreover chabahar port is also important to connect india with the central asia to connect india with the central asia clear so therefore the chabahar port is important secondly uh, we have seen this particular thing that international north south transport corridor has also started now international north south transport corridor connects russia central asia and iran russia central asia and iran so basically guys when we talk about the uh, international north south transport corridor it's culminating in iran and by using this using this international north south transport corridor what can happen india can again just a minute so india can again get the connectivity india can again get the connectivity to the central asian markets central asian markets russian markets right now the passage is very long right now the passage is very long so for again in a nutshell in one line in one line you need to understand that for instc international north south transport corridor and at the same time because of the chabahar port iran has become very important partner and the third reason third reason is that we want to import the crude oil from iran till 2019 till 2019 we were importing the crude oil from iran but after 2019 usa has threatened india that if india will continue the trade with the iran then there will be the sanctions that will be imposed on india but now again we want to resume the trade with the iran is it clear fine so that is something that has happened okay so in this particular capacity right now the issues going on in iran will be seeing them a little bit briefly okay so let's see this particular entire article okay now first of all when we talk about the iran guys okay so we find this particular thing that 1979 1979 is a watershed moment very important moment for the iran because before 1979 what happened there was monarchy in the iran there was monarchy in the iran now this particular monarchy was replaced in 1979 and we call it as the iranian revolution what happened iranian revolution came in 1979 monarchy was reformed okay well, monarchy was removed monarchy was removed so basically the shah the shah popularly called as a shah or the mohammad raza pahlavi mohammad raza pahlavi was the ruler of iran till 1979 now you see this particular thing that actually in 1950 in 1950 around 1953 actually the mohammad raza pahlavi Uh, ran from the iran he flew from the iran but he was again placed in the iran by the support of the cia of usa so he was again placed into the iran now you know this particular thing guys that 1950s was the time when the cold war between the usa and ussr started now as the cold war was going on the usa feared this particular thing that if in iran if the mohammad raza pahlavi will be removed from the iran then the ussr might get a better 
control here into the Iran. So therefore, USA brought the Mohammad Raza Pahlavi, who was the loyalist to the USA, and he was again placed onto the throne into the Iran. Okay, so the Mohammad Raza Pahlavi, okay, was a con uh, continued its rule, and actually he was very much detached from the political reality onto the ground. He organized the grand ceremonies, celebrated the monarchy into these grand ceremonies. A lot of money got wasted. A lot of money got wasted. Okay, and moreover, he uh, he banned the majority of the political parties except the monarchist resurgence party. Monarchist resurgence party that is Hazabe. Hazabe. Rashtakis. Okay. So, therefore, the people did not like him and therefore against him, moreover, social justice was not taken care of. So, against him, a lot of discontent developed and in 1979, he was removed. 1979, he was removed and finally, the Iranian revolution of 1979 came. After that, what had happened? After that, what had happened? It was promised that an elected structure, a democracy will be installed into the Iran. But at the same time, after 1979, the Shia clergy now guys clergy means clergy means the ruling uh, clergy means the religious class clergy means the religious class so okay so shia clergy shia religious class has become very important post 1979 now if i tell you little bit of the iranian the political system of iran so iran has a very unique kind of a political system it has it has both it has both elected institutions as well as unelected branches Okay, now first of all, when we talk about the elected branch, there is the president, there is the president, then there is a parliament which is called as a majlis, then there is the assembly of experts. Now, these three bodies that is the president, parliament, and the assembly of experts they are elected direct uh, they are directly elected by the people so these are the elected bodies and then after that there is the supreme leader there is the supreme leader of iran now this supreme leader of iran uh, okay uh, then there is the guardian council and then there are the expediency council these three bodies that is the supreme leader guardian council and expediency council they are appointed by the clergy the religious class and the supreme leader is actually the most important figurehead in the iran the supreme leader makes sure that the he makes sure that particular thing that the that the Shia norms, Shia norms are being followed, okay, any law that is being formed, it is needed to be in line with the Islamic customs, Islamic traditions, all those particular things are made sure by the supreme leader of uh, supreme leader of Iran. Now, when we talk about the president of Iran, president of Iran is the head of the government, but he is not the head of the state. Why? Because the head of the state is the supreme leader. Now, the president is in charge of the day-to-day -day affairs, day-to-day -day matters. Okay, but after that, the supreme leader is the most powerful authority in the Iran. Okay, now when we talk about the president, a presidential term is a four-year. So, a presidential term is a four-year and one president can maximum hold two terms fine not more than two consecutive terms but when we talk about the supreme leader supreme leader up till now post 1979 only two supreme leaders have been there okay uh, they have been there the oh, iran has seen only two supreme leaders one was the khomeini who died in 1989 and the other is the Khamenei, who is right now the supreme leader. Okay. Now, guys, when we talk about the elections process in Iran, the election process in Iran, basically it has been said that the elections are fair, but whether actually they are fair or not, we don't know that thing. Even in 2009, there were a lot of disputes also that happened, but they are not completely, they are not completely independent elections. For example, what happens? The election process. Now, every candidate who wants to contest the election, they are to be vetted by the guardian council. They are to be vetted by the guardian council and only the people whose names will be approved by the guardian council they will they can fight the election okay so are there completely free and independent elections that is something that we need to see then moving on after that guys so basically uh, in the iran okay in the iran there is an 88 member uh, assembly of experts assembly of experts so this assembly of experts this assembly of experts actually elects the uh, actually appoints the supreme leader this assembly of uh, experts appoints the supreme leader. Okay, the supreme leader doesn't come by the election. Okay, so this is something that's happening. Now, 
so uh, just in a nutshell is so that you uh, understand this particular thing so in the iran the political system consists of two branches one is the elected branch into that elected branch there will be the president there will be then the majlis that is the parliament and the thirdly thirdly there will be the assembly of experts they will be elected then on another hand there is the unelected branch in unelected branch there is the supreme leader then there is the guardian council there is a supreme leader then there is guardian council and then there is expediency council now when we talk about iran when we talk about iran in iran there are two principal political groups that are there one they are called as principalist okay i'll use a different color pen so that you can see it more clearly so one are the principalist and the second are the reformist just a minute one are the principalist and second are the reformist now see the principalist are uh, the conservative block of the iran conservative block conservative block means that they are not very much acceptable to the liberal ideas they are not very much acceptable to new modern ideas okay so the principalist they are the conservative block and they enjoy the largest support within the clergy between the religious classes on another hand there are the reformist now reformist are the people who talks about the social reform social justice liberal values all these particular kind of things but actually the principalist have been more powerful now when we talk about the reformist in the past there have been the reformist presidents who had come in iran for example mohammad khatami mohammad khatami was elected as president in 1997 and he was a reformist politician he was a reformist uh, he was the proponent of reformist politics but he was not able to bring many of the substantial reforms he failed to bring major changes into the system and at the same time clergy clergy okay uh, clergy held a very important role so therefore the reformist leaders have not been able to make a lot of dent then the hasan rouhani now hasan rouhani which was the former the earlier president of the iran he was also a reformist but again he was also not able to bring much of the reform but now the present uh, now, now, now the in present president that is the uh, ibrahim raisi ibrahim raisi who is the present president he is belonging to the principalist group principalist group means that they are more conservative and even if you remember uh, they are more conservative and right now what happen the clergy is already conservative supreme leader again inclined to the conservatism and president again have big belongs to the principalist who were conservative and by that particular thing we have seen this particular thing by this particular thing we have seen this particular thing that the democracy has become limited limited democracy and unlimited theocracy theocracy means the rule by a religious class okay so you know first of all that the supreme leader is the most important person into the iran so the theocracy is becoming more and more um, it, it's becoming uh, it's becoming more and more prominent now if you remember just a few days back we have seen this thing that recently the protest started into the iran when a young girl was detained was arrested why because she was not wearing the hijab properly she was wearing the hijab in an improper way she was detained arrested and she died in that particular custody now the family members say that she was tortured to death okay now we find this thing that even for a very minor thing that is not wearing a hijab find the girl got arrested so the democratic values the liberalism the justice the freedoms of the people they are getting negated and this is not the way in which a democracy works so though on the face democracy has come but still the theocracy still the religious authorities the clergy plays a very important role in the iran okay so that is something that has happened okay so this is guys all about this particular article okay this is all about this particular article i hope that you have understood this particular article and now we'll be moving to the next article okay now uh, the next article that is the talent and recognition talent and recognition now this particular article guys talks about the recent decision that has been taken by the government with respect to the pruning of awards now what's pruning pruning is to cut short anything pruning is to cut short anything is it clear or not so you see that suppose there is a tree now when the branches of this particular tree will be growing out fine will cut these particular branches we call it as a pruning okay so recently what has happened recently what has happened actually actually the center government the center government has decided that the awards and the prizes and the fellowships 
fellowships, awards and prizes that are particularly being given to the scientific communities, they will be cut short. Okay. And in this particular thing, in this particular thing, uh, the Ministry of Home Affairs has been given a specific responsibility that they need to make sure that even the awards that are being given, how many of them needs to be cut short. Now, basically understand this thing, guys, that when we talk about the scientific community, okay, they are given awards. Number one, they are the national awards. Number one, there are the national awards. Now, national awards are those awards which are given by the government, which are funded by the government. And after the national awards, the second type of awards that are there, they are given by the uh, private endowments. Awards given by the private endowments. Is it clear or not? Now, uh, understand this particular thing that when these national awards are there, fine, many awards are being given to the scientific communities at particular levels in their many junctures of the reforms. Now, it has been provided, it has been provided that the prime minister, the prime minister has a vision regarding the transformation of the awards ecosystem. Prime minister said that unnecessary awards, appreciations should not be given, only the relevant awards, few national awards needs to be there. So, a reform into the award giving system has been envisaged and in order to implement that particular thing government is now government is now looking towards the pruning of the awards government is now looking for the reform into the award system now understand this particular thing nothing has been finalized in this direction neither government has said that which reforms will be retained which reforms will be uh, sorry which awards will be retained which awards will be removed government will come on this particular matter but they have started the work now what this article is talking about this article is saying this thing that the step that the government is trying to take is not a very progressive kind of a step okay now there are certain arguments that have been given okay now let's understand what the arguments are talking about now the first argument that comes it says that when we talk about the awards and the prizes okay they recognize achievement they recognize achievement that's one thing but at the same time into the science and the medical research they also motivate the young scientist Okay, they also motivate the young scientists that they should work hard. Okay, this is something that is being given. Now, it has been said that when we talk about the sports, okay, sports, or when we talk about the gallantry awards, gallantry awards, for example, are given to the police officers. Okay, okay, it is easy to identify the benchmarks. It is easy to identify the benchmarks. For example, if you, uh, for example, into the sports, let's say a person who wins the gold medal or a person who has won particular number of awards for the country in the international championship they'll be given the award so there is a benchmark the police officer or the armed services officers there are certain benchmarks on whose basis they can be given the awards but in the scientific arena that's not the case now when we talk about the scientific research it is open ended okay uh, it is open ended then there are the scientific researches that are to be validated by the other scientific communities many times a lot of luck is needed into the science is it clear or not so basically the awards into the science they are more important to the scientific communities they are more important to the scientific communities as they keep their morale high they keep their they they keep them boosted okay uh, just a uh, guys one minute I think there is some connection issue. Let me just give me one second. Okay. Okay. Is everything clear? Is the uh, voice and everything clear? Okay, now I think it's clear. Okay, so let's come in, uh, let's come back to the point. So the point was very simple that when we talk about the awards that are being given to the scientific community, they are needed to be given continuously because they keep the scientist motivated. Fine. It has been said that when we talk about the sports, it is possible to train talented youth to be Olympians or to be international cricketers, but you cannot create a an Einstein. If you cannot create an Einstein, you cannot create create a uh, Chandrasekhar okay so it has been said that therefore we need to make sure we need to make sure that they are being awarded at continuous at uh, at uh, the important junctures of their life when they make some invention when they make some discovery even when we talk about the Nobel laureates Nobel Prize winner 
Nobel Prize is not the only prize of for them. They have won various secondary prizes. Okay, for example, Fields, Medal, and many such kind of awards they have won early in their career. And that particular thing keeps them motivated that they should do other scientific discoveries and eventually they win the Nobel Prize. So therefore, it has been said that the idea, idea of pruning the awards, that we need to reduce the awards and need to give only few relevant national awards, that might not be entirely a correct idea, particularly for the scientific community. Such things should not be done. That has been given in this particular article. Now guys, again I am telling you one particular thing. Government had said this particular thing that the uh, pr prizes, uh, the prizes, the awards, okay, the fellowships, supports, financial supports that are being given, they will need a, they will need a wholesale relook. Okay, so relook will be given. Okay, and the Ministry of Home Affairs have been given an important role. But which awards will be retained, which awards will be removed, that is not come out till now. That has not been finalized. So when it will happen, we'll see that issue also. Okay, so that is all guys about this particular article. I hope that this is clear and now I want, uh, now we'll move to the next article. In nature's warning signs, a nudge to riparian states. In nature's warning sign, a nudge to riparian state. Now, this is a very, very good article, very, very good article. And the article is talking about the cooperation within the riparian states onto the water front. Okay. Now, before going in this particular article, where this article will be important, this article will be important in GS paper number three, disaster management. GS paper number three, disaster management, within the disaster management, flooding, within the disaster management, flooding. And secondly, this particular article will also be important in GS paper number two, international relation, international cooperation, international cooperation. Okay. Now, before going in this particular article, I wanted to tell you some of the basic concepts. Okay. First of all, the riparian state. Riparian state is a state which is located alongside a river. Okay, so riparian state are the states or the countries which are located along with a river. Okay, for example, when we talk about Brahmaputra, now Brahmaputra is shared between the China, India, and Bangladesh. So China, India, and Bangladesh all are the riparian states. China, India, and Bangladesh all are the riparian countries because they are situated alongside the Brahmaputra River. Okay, so this is the concept of a riparian state. Now, moving on. So basically, uh, we find this thing that into the past, we find this particular thing that into the past, there have been the huge uh, flooding event that has happened and very big magnitude of floods have been there. And the recent example is of Pakistan. So Pakistan, there was very big de devastating flood and one third of Pakistan got submerged. There is a shortage of drinking water, life, property, everything got disturbed in Pakistan. Then we find this particular thing that the flooding in India has also increased. For example, in Assam, this particular year, there was a huge flooding that happened and 30 of the districts of the Assam, they got impacted by the flood. Then when we talk about the Bihar, Bihar, the, the recurrent flooding happens into the Bihar. So Assam, Bihar, they are very much prone to the flood. And you see, Every year when a flood is come, when there is a flooding event, life property gets lost, people's livelihood get uprooted and they have to start from the scratch. So therefore, the state where there are many disasters and on frequent basis they are coming, poverty will be very much high. When we talk about the Bihar, in Bihar, we find that there is so high poverty and poverty alleviation cannot be successful until and unless these disasters are managed. Fine, when we talk about the Millennium Developmental Goals that were to be achieved by 2015. Now, the Sustainable Developmental Goals that are to be achieved by 2030, poverty alleviation happens to be a very important goal. And, when, and the poverty alleviation will never be successful until and unless we don't cater to these disasters. Okay. Now, when we talk about the flooding, when we talk about the flooding, it is supposed to be a natural phenomena, natural phenomena. And it has been said that it cannot be completely prevented. Yes, it cannot be completely prevented, but it can be minimized. It can be mitigated. Many a times the flooding, man-made floodings that are there, intentional floodings that are there, they can be effectively managed. Now, see this particular thing. Sometimes, sometimes there is the lack of transparency in sharing of the hydro logical information and information related to activities of water. Now I want to give you one example. Okay, now you see this particular thing. You see this particular thing. Now suppose this is the China 
uh, okay let's uh, see this particular picture here now we find this particular thing that the okay uh, that in the china sangpo is originating in china the sangpo is originating now it's entering in india in a, it's entering in india and in india it becomes brahmaputra and then it enters into the bangladesh now you see this particular thing that the water activities that are being done into the china china needs to share the information with the india china needs to share the information with the india and india needs to share the information with the bangladesh for example sometimes there will be uh, the flooding in the catchment area that will come and more waters more water flow will be entering into the india now india needs to be given this particular information in the timely manner by the china so that india can takes india can take the preventive steps india can take the mitigating steps is it clear or not so basically it has been said that there needs to be the transparency in hydrological information hydrological information means information related to the quantum of water flow of water okay sometimes sometimes the uh, you know this particular thing that onto the river dams are also constructed now the release of the water from the dam will happen so if the china is releasing the water from the dam china needs to notify india in advance that okay after two days will release the water so you please be prepared for that thing so such hydrological information information related to the activities okay of the riparian states needs to be notified now if such kind of a thing doesn't happens then the flooding events flooding events can increase okay just you see this particular thing suppose 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 china has constructed a dam china has constructed a dam on sangpo now china opens the flood gates of this particular dam and doesn't notifies the india in advance what will happen there will be the flooding that will come or let's say there is abnormal water flow due to high rains or due to some event into the catchment area and china doesn't give that information to india what will happen the flooding will happen now i tell you one particular thing uh, if you remember i don't know whether you will remember or not but few months back i think 10 Ten or eleven months back, or probably one year back, we have seen the China's water wars. The China's water wars. Now it has been said this particular thing that China is deliberately creating the infrastructure into the upper reaches of Brahmaputra. Okay, so that these dams that the China will construct, they can use these particular dams water for their own strategic purpose. Okay, so the water wars, something this is a strategy of the China. So therefore, information is to be shared. Now, when we talk about guys, India and China water sharing. Okay, so uh, first of all. first of all when we talk about the water sharing now it has been provided by the international law it has been provided by the international law that no state can use its territory in a manner that causes harm to another state while using a shared natural resource now water is a shared natural resource china doesn't have any right that they can use that water in such a way or they can store the water in their territory in such a way that it can cause some problem to india that is something there so therefore there is a binding obligation of all the states not to release water to cause floods in another co-sharer of the water okay moreover there needs to be the notification of the planned measures measures that they are taking exchange of data and information water information needs to be there public participation with respect to these activities need to be there this is something that's there now let's talk about the case study of the india and china in particular india and china case study in particular see basically the brahmaputra brahmaputra has been a river which uh, brahmaputra flooding has been the major brahmaputra flooding leads to the assam crisis almost every year now when we talk about the china china is the upper riparian state into the matters of brahmaputra it is the upper state okay now in the monsoon in the monsoon the flooding has always been a year now the china is a dam controller okay and china has a power to exacerbate the flooding into the assam in future now when we talk about the present times present times there is no comprehensive sub basin or all basin level mechanism we don't have an overarching scheme overarching mechanism which enables the exchange of water information between india and china right now right now guys there is an international convention for such sharing of water that is there and that is the united nation convention on the law of the non navigational uses of international water courses or in short you can call it as unwc convention of 1997 this convention mandates the exchange of water information but neither india is a party of this convention nor china is the party of this convention and after that there is also the 1992 water convention 
Fine, and India and China has not signed even this 1992 water convention. So therefore, right now, how the information between India and China is shared onto the water? So for that particular thing, there is an MOU. There is an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, that we signed with the China in 2013. And as per this 2013 MOU, the hydrological information is shared between the month of June to September. Okay, so information is shared between three uh, months. Okay, uh, uh, June, July, uh, four months, June, July, August, September. That is something that has happened. Now, this particular MOU does not give access to urbanization and deforestation activities in the Chinese side of the river basin. Now, you see that what urbanization is happening, other developmental activities that the China is doing, dam building activities that the China is doing. Is it clear or not? Fine, deforestation. Now, you know this particular thing that when deforestation happens, the flooding events uh, okay they also gets impacted they increase so that information is not given by the china very less information is given so therefore therefore it has been provided that now by keeping this mou of 2013 in background india and china should either sign the unwc convention of 1997 or we should sign the water convention of water convention of the 1992 these two conventions the unwc convention or water convention should be signed so that more information sharing can happen. Then, when we talk about the Bihar floods, when we talk about the Bihar floods, there much has to do with the India-Nepal cooperation. Now, in the Bihar, the flooding happens because of the overflow in the Kosi River and the Gandak River. Okay. So, there are the Kosi River, okay, and the Gandak River. Okay. So, because of that, the flooding into the Bihar is observed. Now, we find this particular thing that there is heavy seasonal rains, seasonal precipitations that there. Moreover, guys, there are the glacial retreat that's happening. Now, because of the climate change, temperatures are increasing. More glacial retreat are there. More water flow from the glaciers are there. So, that's also is exhibiting the problem. Now, when we talk about when we talk about the India and Nepal, there is the India-Nepal Kosi Agreement of 1954, which got revised in 1996. Now, this India-Nepal Kosi Agreement, it provides the sharing of some kind of an information. Okay, the joint bodies have been created and they have tried to create the early warning systems for the flood forecasting. But still, this has not been very much successful. Now, guys, on this particular thing, we further need to redefine the India-Nepal Kosi Agreement as how effective water sharing can happen. Now, one thing I want to tell you. Basically, it has been the case that here, India is also at mistake at many number of times. For example, uh, the India considers the data on a transboundary river as classified information. Okay. Now, we say that the data of the river, the data of the water, the transboundary river, if they are there, the data of water is a classified information. Neither we share that thing with the Nepal and because we consider as classified information, we cannot ask from the Nepal. So, that is one complicated challenge that is coming in between. Is it clear or not? So, therefore, it has been provided that we need to further cooperate with the Nepal and we should not consider the in transboundary river water data as the classified data. We have already seen that the huge catastrophic floods that have come into the Pakistan, they have impacted Pakistan in such a big way. So, India should be prepared about this particular kind of thing in the future. That's all guys, which has been provided in this particular article. Now, moving to the next article. Rediscovering the Bay of Bengal. Rediscovering the Bay of Bengal. Now, this article will again see with respect to the GS paper number 2, International Relation or international groupings international groupings or you can say it multilateral groupings so in the topic of international groupings multilateral groupings we'll see this particular article now this particular article it talks about the bay or the bimstack it talks about the bimstack fine now let's talk about the article so guys first of all let's see some of the basic information about the bimstack that will be important for you to understand this article now the bimstack it stands for bay of bengal initiative for multi sectoral technical and economic cooperation okay so i'll zoom it out so that you can see so bimstack it stands for bay of bengal bay of bengal initiative for multi sectoral Techni technical and economic cooperation in the bimstack there is bangladesh sri lanka india Nepal, Bhutan, 
थाईलैंड एंड म्यांमार ओके ऑल दीज कंट्रीज आर इन द बिम्स्टेक फाइन सो दीज आर द कंट्रीज इन टू द बिम्स्टेक नाउ वेन वी टॉक अबाउट द बिम्स्टेक बिम्स्टेक वॉज फाउंडेड इन नाइनटीन नाइन सेवन नाइनटीन नाइन सेवन बाई साइनिंग ऑफ द बैंकॉक by the signing of the bangkok declaration the bimstech was signed is it clear now when we talk about the bimstech bimstechs what are the bimstechs what are the bimstechs key areas bimstechs wants to increase the integration between the countries economic cooperation is to be increased economic cooperation is to be increased technical cooperation is to be increased is it clear or not now when we talk about the bimstech okay uh, bimstech so what happened in the fourth bimstech summit in the fourth bimstech summit that was signed okay way back in 2018 there the indian prime minister said this thing that the center of bay of bengal studies center of bay of bengal studies which will be developed at the nalanda university okay so in the fourth bimstech summit prime minister said that the center of bay of bengal studies will be developed now this center of bay of bengal studies has demonstrated india's commitment to constructively set the agendas find in the bay of bengal region in the bay of bengal region now understand this particular thing that first of all guys when we talk about this cbs that is the center for bay of bengal studies it will provide the collaborations on geo economics geopolitics ecology trade connectivity maritime security maritime law cultural heritage blue economy okay and the opportunities that can be generated into the bay of bengal now you see this particular thing first of all what do we mean by geo economics geo economics simply mean that how the countries within the bimstech for example the bangladesh sri lanka india nepal bhutan thailand and myanmar how these countries can sign the trade agreements with each other so that the tariffs are reduced so that more exports and imports can happen between these countries and collectively the economic improvement of the region can happen so it will suggest how the geo economic initiatives are to be taken geopolitical initiatives geopolitical initiatives now guys when we talk about the bimstech countries it can become a political entity it can become a political entity and it can keep forward their political interest their political interest against the world so it can be the geopolitical how ecology now you see this entire bay of bengal region there are the ecological challenges that are coming okay now i will discuss this ecological challenges just into the coming paragraph trade connectivity maritime security the security of the the, 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 the lanes of transport how can be ensured maritime law every country for example the united nation convention on the law of seas un, UN clause so how the un clause and all the international laws needs to be followed heritage conservation blue economy what's blue economy now you see this particular thing blue economy it's the economic potential that can be provided by the water by the ocean so in ocean we have the marine resources such as the lobsters fishes then guys particularly there are the polymetallic nodules so there are the gaseous uh, resources in the water oil resources into the water marine ecology all these things can provide economic benefit so to leverage the economic potentials of the water economic potentials of the sea we call it as a blue economic leverage so on all these particular things the cbs the center for the center for bay of bengal studies will provide the uh, knowledge okay that's something that's happening now when we talk about the bay of bengal bay of bengal has been a major commerce hub for the indian ocean so the indian ocean when we talk about the indian ocean okay the bay of bengal has has been a very important connecting point in that so bay of bengal connects east and the west in terms of the trade and culture okay then guys an indo pacific orientation and the realignment of global economic and military power towards asia again makes bay of bengal an important region now we see the indo pacific we see the indo pacific it's becoming more important indian ocean indian ocean rim association for example is making indian ocean an important region so when the focus of this region will increase uh, fine the bay of bengal will automatically become important now the when we talk about the lanes of communication lanes of trade okay now which are the lifeline of the global economic security they pass is around the bay of bengal so bay of bengal provides a greater opportunity it provides the greater opportunity for regional cooperation to all the countries moreover environmental friendly exploration of marine and energy resources also needs to be given also needs to be ensured also needs to be focused into the bay of bengal now there are certain challenges that are coming into the bay of bengal region first of all first of all there is the environmental exploitation that's happening 
now you see this particular thing that over the years there is the exploitation of the species that happened okay unsustainable fishing has happened unsustainable unsustainable tapping of the uh, marine resources have happened and therefore many of the species are becoming extinct population growth into the region has happened land use is being altered excessive resource exploitation salinization sea level rise climate change all these are the challenges into the bay of bengal moreover the pollution into the bay of bengal has also increased now the discharge from the uh, small and the medium ships shipping collisions oil spills that are happening industrial waste pollution okay accumulation of non biodegradable plastic sources okay now understand this particular thing that what's happening these discharges these effluents the oil spills that are happening they are choking the entire bay of bengal they are choking the entire bay of bengal moreover when we talk about guys the bay of bengal okay we know the sundarbans sundarbans which are shared between the india and bangladesh they stand at the protection of the coast now the mangrove trees around the sundarbans they are get they are dying they are dying a kind of a dead zone okay so what has happened a kind of a dead zone has been formed in the bay of bengal okay and the marine ecology is getting declined there so this is guys all the issues that are coming in this particular direction okay so therefore what can be the way forward now we need to focus on inter country cooperation we need to focus on inter country cooperation interdisciplinary study is required on the issues for example how ecology will impact economy how ecology will impact economy how environment will impact economy how strategic and economic issues can be converged so for all these particular kind of a things interdisciplinary study is required and who will do these interdisciplinary study the cbs that is a center for bay of bengal studies that will be done now at the same time maritime neighbors also need to develop the partnership and cooperation onto the maritime domain okay so all the members of the bimstech they need to come together and they need to partner with each other so that the information sharing can happen okay and at the same time the immediate attention needs to be given on extending the cooperation maritime safety security or maritime connectivity and all these particular things we need to focus upon okay and the governments governments littoral government government in all these particular states need to help each other this is all the expectations that are there from the bimstech and if worked on this particular thing bimstech can become a very important and a viable multilateral organization and in this direction cbs that is a center for uh, center of bay of bengal all studies that have been instituted by india at nalanda university will play a very very important role so that's all about it and now we'll move to the next article okay now automation has impacted lower level jobs in banks automation has impacted the lower level jobs in banks now what this particular article is all about okay now guys now guys understand this particular thing just a minute okay so uh, we find this uh, particular thing many number of times we have seen this particular thing that actually uh, automation automation technology that is coming that automation and technology will deprive the human labor will deprive the human labor now many of the jobs that were deep that many of the works that were being done by the manual labor that particular work will now be done that work will be done by the computers okay automation will come digitization will come so there is a theme that the automation automation digitization automation digitization will replace the manual labor will replace the manual labor and this particular impact this particular impact is being seen already into the banking sector this impact is already being seen into the banking sector okay so therefore so therefore this particular topic will see with respect to the gs paper number 3 this topic will be seen with respect to the gs paper number 3 that is the impact of digitization on employment impact of digitization on to the employment okay now what the article is talking about so the article says this particular thing that recently the finance ministry has asked the heads of the public sector bank how to improve the employee count now you know this thing that when we talk about the public banks PSUs, public sector units, they are not just the agencies for delivering one particular service or just to for manufacturing the goods in case of PSU, but they are also the employment generation avenues as well. Now, in the past, we have seen this thing that the ATM usage have increased, online and mobile transactions are have increased. Okay, 
and as many of the services can be accessed by either internet or by the mobile what has happened in the past there is also the reduction into the number of the new physical branches even the footfall into the banks have reduced footfall into the banks have reduced because you don't need to go to the bank you can do most of these particular works through your mobile or through the online thing now by that particular thing what's happened happening there is a decline into the clerical staff there is a decline into the clerical staffs now even the people are not interested in preparing for the bank jobs requirement of such kind of a people are not there because all these particular uh, jobs have become automated they have become digitized okay now in this particular capacity guys this entire article is talking about these particular things okay so basically <coughs> now the article says that uh, the article is talking about that how in just a minute so here the chart shows that total number of staff in public sector banks and the private sector banks is it clear or not so the staff as we talk about fine so when we talk about the staff into these particular things okay in the banks and etc they have been increasing now see uh, the atm withdrawals have been discussed okay atm withdrawals using debit cards have been discussed that upi transactions have been discussed all are increasing all are increasing fine now one thing i want to tell that you don't need to go too much into the data okay just these numbers and the graphs that okay how many uh, how many lakh staff increased decreased how many atm transactions increased decreased that number is not important just this i idea is important that digitization has brought a considerable impact in the banking sector okay in the banking sector so this is a very important idea that you need to so beyond this idea you don't need to go in this particular graphs etc that has been given into the article now we'll move to the next one okay so the next article uh, okay so the budget to reset just a minute budget to reset tax laws to decriminalize sections in it gst in it gst now understand uh, one particular thing that what this particular article is talking about uh, guys actually this article is talking about that the next budget that will come that is the 2023 24 budget that will come in that particular budget many of the important reforms will be taken care of many of the important reforms will be taken care of now understand this particular thing that there are many of the provisions in our uh, many of the gst laws for example it act there are many of the provisions these provisions have some kind of a negative impact on to the tax compliance now you see this particular thing that actually there are many of the provisions for example uh, just a minute there is provisions into the income tax act provisions into the goods and the services tax act then there are the custom laws provisions that are there now many of these particular provisions whatever they are intending all those things have already been provided into the ipc moreover there are many of the liabilities that are actually the criminal liabilities for example i'll just tell you suppose i forgot to file the income tax return now failure to file an income tax return needs to be a kind of a civil liability okay and the tax compliances majorly the tax compliances needed to be a civil liability you impose a fine for that particular thing but what has happened many of the tax compliances they come into the criminal category okay so there is that it comes into the criminal category so there is the criminalization of the taxation laws that had happened into the india and now what we want to do we want to go for the decriminalization of the taxation laws okay so for example if a person was not able to go for some tax compliance rather than treating it as a communal offense criminal offense we need to treat it as a civil offense so there are many of the provisions in our it act gst act which are which where the criminal liability is there so that particular thing will be removed and it will be put into the civil liability moreover guys there are also the prohibitive compounding charges that are there under the gst now for example for example if you fail to pay your gst tax if you fail to pay your gst tax there are the compounding liabilities that will be there fine 50 percent to 150 percent penalties onto the tax are there now you see that when 50 to 150 percent penalties onto the taxes are being paid what a person will do a person will not altogether pay anything now if the penalty could be let's say 10 percent 12 percent a person could have considered paying these particular penalties but when the penalties are increasing to 150 percent okay nobody is paying the penalties so therefore the compound 
compounding of the penalties will be reduced and many of the criminal liabilities that are there into the tax compliances they will be converted into the civil liabilities they will be converted into the civil liabilities that is one thing that's happening so therefore the budget of 23 24 that's coming in that budget all these particular things will be done okay now the thresholds for considering tax evasion a criminal offense are also being reviewed now one concept i want to explain that is tax avoidance just a minute one concept i want to explain that is the tax avoidance and tax evasion tax evasion okay now what's tax tax avoidance now guys you see this particular thing that there are many of the provisions in our income tax act and by using these legal provisions we can save on the taxes okay for example guys i went for some tax management i went for some tax planning and i took many of the exemptions i took many of the uh, many of the exemptions and many such kind of laws i used so that is a tax avoidance now second is a tax evasion tax evasion is stealing the tax from the government now what happens people deliberately under report their income suppose you are earning 10 lakh rupees but you'll say that okay i'm earning only 2 lakh rupees so 8 lakh rupees you have under reported that is a tax evasion that is a tax ki chori okay tax avoidance is not unlawful tax uh, avoidance is not unlawful okay tax evasion is unlawful okay you getting it or not so tax evasion is unlawful tax avoidance can be done so basically it has been said that many a time people are doing the tax evasion now suppose you did a tax evasion of just 50000 rupees some other person did a tax evasion of let's say 1 crore rupees so obviously 1 crore rupees a tax evasion is a bigger thing so basically when to treat the tax evasion as a criminal thing so that particular thresholds will also be reviewed these are thresholds will also be reviewed and for all these particular things what will happen it will be done into the finance bill okay, uh, it, it will be done into the budget changes that will be brought into the union budget of 2023-2024 okay now exactly what will happen exactly what will happen that government will come out in the budget provisions up till now the exact details have not come just government is saying that okay we'll streamline all these particular laws will decriminalize okay so budget budget will now you read the heading budget will reset the tax laws decriminalization sections into the it act gst act so when this thing will final happen in coming few months then we will see so till then no need to go too much into the detail in this particular article okay so no need to go too much into the detail in this particular article okay so that is all guys about this particular thing now uh there is one more development there is one more uh, development that has happened and by mistake i forgot to add that into this synoptic notes file i'll add one more synoptic notes file on the telegram channel and you can access these notes into that additional file so by mistake i forgot to add that file in these particular notes that have been there so one more article i want to discuss just give me one minute so that i can show you it on the screen just give me one minute so that i can show you it onto the screen Okay. 
Fine. So I will share this particular notes on the uh, on the Telegram channel also. Let's see this particular article as what this article is talking about. So basically, what has happened? What has happened? The Archaeological Survey of India, the Archaeological Survey of India, has made certain discoveries into the Bandhavgarh, into the Bandhavgarh Tiger Reserve of the Madhya Pradesh. Okay, on the Bandhavgarh Tiger Reserve of the Madhya Pradesh. So let's see all these particular developments, and all these developments will be seen with respect to GS paper number one, GS. Paper number one, uh, GS paper number one, art and culture. GS paper number one, art and culture. And for the prelims examination, for the prelims examination, PT examination also, this particular article will be important. Is it clear or not? Now, uh, so okay. So what has happened? The Archaeological Survey of India, the Archaeological Survey of India, has reported some of the discoveries that have been done into the Bandhavgarh region of the Madhya Pradesh. Now, what has happened in the discovery that has been done? The Buddhist caves have been found. The Buddhist caves have been found. The temples have been found into the Bandhavgarh region of the Madhya Pradesh. Now, first of all, 26 Buddhist caves have been found, and these 26 Buddhist caves they are from second and the the fifth century from second or fifth century times the 26 buddhist caves have been found now guys understand this particular thing that along along with the caves there are the remains of the mahayan sect has also been found now what's the mahayan sect when we talk about the buddhism when we talk about the buddhism buddhism got divided in two of the sects one was the henian one was the henian and other was the mahayan now the Hinayan were the ones who followed the original teachings of the Buddhism and the Mahayan were the one who reformed some of the original teachings of the Buddhism. So the Mahayan sects, Mahayan sects structures have been found. Now what has been found in the Mahayan sect? The Achetya has been found. Now when we talk about the Buddhist architecture, so in the Buddhist architecture two main types of architectures we find one are the Chetyas and other are the Vihar. Now Vihar, Vihar are the places where the monks used to live. These were the residential units, and the chetyas were the uh, chetyas were the places where the Buddha, Buddha, Buddhist monks they used to study. They used to read the scriptures. So, along with the twenty-six caves, just a minute. Along with the twenty-six caves that have been found. 26 caves that have been found the um, uh, the, the chetyas leading to the belonging to the mahayan sect have also been found now they had rounded shaped doors okay they are the cells containing the stone beds okay and a varaha scriptures of the 9th to 10th, 13th century has also been found okay so basically this varaha structure has been found and this uh, is supposed to be this is supposed to be one of the biggest structure of the Varaha that has been ever found. Now, what is Varaha? Varaha is the avatar of the Hindu god Vishnu. So, Vishnu's uh, Vishnuji's avatar is Varaha. So, Varaha is the avatar of the god Vishnu. God Vishnu. So, Varaha is the avatar of the god Vishnu. Okay, so the Varaha, uh, just a minute, Varaha sculpture has been found and it is the world's largest sculpture that has ever been reported. So, this is particularly very, very important, particularly very, very important that the biggest Varaha sculpture, biggest, biggest Varaha sculpture has been found. Where it has been found? It has been found into the Bandhavgarh Tiger Reserve, where in the Madhya Pradesh. Okay. Then guys, after that particular thing, a Buddhist pillar has also been found. A Buddhist pillar has been found. Okay. Fine. Uh, containing miniature stupa carvings. Now, what are the stupas? Stupas are the place where the holy relics of the where where the whole where the holy relics belonging to Buddha were were buried. So the stupa has also been found. No, no, the stupa has not been found. The pillar has been found. And on this particular pillar, on this particular pillar, the cravings of the stupa are there. Now in the Bandhavgarh reserve, the total number of caves that now we have, they are seventy six. So already fifty caves were there, and now along with this fifty caves, the twenty six more caves have been found. So in total, seventy six caves are there. Now the exploration exercise that have been carried fine uh, so it has also reported the Gupta period remains. Gupta period remains. Okay, uh, the, the uh, basically the door jams have been found. Ancient temples have been found. Nineteen water bodies have also been excavated. So the remains of the Gupta period have also been found. Okay. Now, according to the officials, the uh, places such as the Koshami, Mathura, 
pavat okay veja bhadra okay all these have been mentioned into the inscriptions that have been found so basically it shows that the inscriptions or the cities that have been listed they might be probably the trading centers they might be the trading centers with which the people might be trading okay so apart from this particular thing apart from this particular thing some more information i want to tell you about the bandhavgarh so bandhavgarh tiger reserve it is located around the eastern satpura hill of the madhya pradesh okay so from there this particular uh, uh, the bandhavgarh derived this name now it is said it is said uh, the name derived this name from the prominent hill of the area which is said to have been given by the lord ram to his brother lakshman to keep a watch watch a, uh, that the hill was given by lord ram to the lakshman so that lakshman can keep a tab can keep an eye on to the lanka okay so the bandavgarh was declared as a national park in 1968 and it then further became the tiger reserve in the 1993 now this tiger has a very big biodiversity and it has the breeding population of leopards deer okay and maharaja marthanand singh of riva captured the first white tiger in this region in 1951 so the first tiger why white tiger was captured in this region into the 1951 fine now you know that white tigers when we talk about it still the white tigers are found into the riva okay so the first white tiger was captured here so these are guys all the information about this particular article fine i hope that you have understood now you see this thing beyond what i have provided you here in this particular handout okay this particular one page you don't need to go and see even one word beyond that particular thing because for the exam whatever is needed all the things we have covered so basically <clears throat> what have been found buddhist caves have been found were has sculpture have been found gupta period remains have been found the temple remains have been found okay so that is all about it i hope that this is clear now we'll be meeting tomorrow till then uh, please take care of yourselves and guys if you have liked the video please do hit the like button and please subscribe to the channel if you have not subscribed and please join the telegram channel from there you can access all these notes thank you so much and I want to really thank for all the lovely comments that you drop every day. Thank you for all of your support. Thank you so much.